Yeah. Cool. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Welcome back. So yeah, now we're going to have Rakesh talking cool. about so, healthy. Um, right. There's a uh, quite a lot of lag on your line, Sophie. Just carry on, finish introducing, and then I'll start. Cool. Okay. So yeah, welcome back, everyone. We've got Rakesh now going to talk about a healthy, ethical, planet-friendly diet. Over to you, Rakesh. Uh -huh. Nice introduction. Uh, I don't actually know what I'm going to talk about, to tell you the truth. Um, so the other day, I was invited to do a talk at an alkaline festival. Uh, so England's first ever alkaline festival, which is going to be here in just down the road from me. And during the conversation, when he asked me what I wanted to talk about, we had a conversation and uh, he gave me some ideas. Or And basically, I woke up the next morning with a really clear idea of what I was going to do. So I kind of suggested it. And then obviously, I didn't write it down. And so I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about. But let's, let's just start the conversation and see where it kind of goes to. So, yeah, so this is fairly free form, and I think I'll use the kind of uh, our collective intelligence to kind of formulate ideas and things. Um, and if you could give me maybe a five minute warning or something so that I can start to wrap up, that'd be great. Sure thing. So the first, the, what, what I basically presented to him was, was my, was a kind of an idea of how I kind of saw how I understand where and why and how we have become such an unhealthy, yeah, why, why we have such an unhealthy diet in, in the West in particular. Um, and if we look back, look back you know, at history, we can see that, uh, you know, especially in the, well, in, in the, in the kind of tropical climates it was really clear you know most of the diets there were lots of fresh fruits and lots of vegetables and uh there wasn't a necessity for so much meat etc and um and so it's a very alkaline uh kind of diet that many people had but as you get to colder climates it gets harder and harder especially in the winter to kind of maintain uh, those diets, hence more predisposition to having more meats and fish and dairy products and so on and so forth, and therefore a much more acid kind of diets. And uh, which is why in many of those climates, you found things like fermentation being a really important part of that diet. Because it's that fermentation that obviously preserves foods, first of all, so that you do have foods for other parts of the year, but also the how it completely changes your, uh, your gut, which I think Sophie's going to talk about uh, in the next session. So how, how it totally changes your gut biome and populates it with really friendly bacteria that helps you to digest foods and obviously with uh, fermentation, as, as we all know, uh, just the process of fermenting it as well as preserving it changes its molecular structure, which actually makes it, so it kind of pre-digests it, which makes it easier for the body to digest and process and actually makes more minerals available than if you just ate, eaten it fresh. So it's actually a really and with, once you add all the, the probiotics, all the bacteria, the additional bacteria that's also cultivated, you can see how really valuable fermented foods were. Um, yeah, so for many, many, many reasons, fermented foods were a really strong part of culture in the colder climates. So, but as uh, globalization, and you know uh, started you know you had um you know what what we found is you know many 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 foods that we take for granted now that we may or may not know have always been fermented such as tea coffee chocolate 
and so on and so forth. Many of these things in their, when they were used traditionally, where they came from, where they originated, they were actually fermented and many of them were used either as medicines or for ritualistic purposes, but they were used very, very sparingly and for very particular purposes. And, uh, and obviously as, as globalization starts, many of these products, which let's face it, when you ferment things, it quite often makes them not, for some people's taste, not so palatable. You know, so maybe a little bit bitter or sour or sour in particular. And, um, and so when these products were being imported into Europe, it wasn't so palatable for the market. You know, they were strange foods, they were unusual foods. So in order to make them more, di more um, acceptable, they started to add things like sugar to them. Now, up to this point, sugar was pretty much just used for medicine uh, in various parts. So again, it was used very, 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 very sparingly and for very particular purposes. It wasn't used as a food, that's for sure. Sorry, I had to switch my phone on because someone was calling me. So let me switch it back off again. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so what we found is, so for example, the British East India Company uh, were buying tea from China. They had no idea what this plant was. They had no idea how to process it and how to actually turn it into tea. They didn't understand the fermentation process. So they started to, well, so the only way they, they could actually get this commodity was actually to buy it from China. Now, uh, what they found in India was an interesting product called opium. And so what the Brits then did is they then got the Chinese, this is well, well, well documented, hooked on opiates and opium, you know, and uh, to the point where uh, now they had a bargaining chip. Now they had a, an ability to rather than just pay them in cash, they actually had a commodity because they'd basically become the world's first major drug dealer. Uh, they had a commodity that they could exchange for tea. So now all of a sudden, this became a much more interesting exchange for them. Uh, as this kind of progressed, the, um, they then finally found, you know, after I think 60, 70 years, they finally found that it was actually came from a plant called Camellia sinensis, which they then imported and started growing in India. Uh, but they still didn't totally understand the, um, the mechanics of how to actually turn it, how to ferment it and turn it into tea. But eventually, over the next X amount of whatever decades, they finally figured it out. And so now they could actually start using Camellia sinensis from India, um, having already, you know, let's say, hooked China and got them into this whole drug habit and everything. Um, but now that all of a sudden they had their own source of it. Now, at the same time, um, I think the Portuguese were growing sugar off of the coast of Africa. And as the British started importing tea and coffee was already kind of, you know, um, a well-established uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, drink, a very, very bitter, very bitter drink that was used as a stimulant in many parts of Asia. They then started importing this as well. And sugar became an absolute necessity for the Western market uh, in order to get this, you know, this incredibly bitter uh, product over. Chocolate, as we know, um, was traditionally also served in a very, very bitter form with um, chili in order to, you know, as a, as a kind of ritualistic practice. And again, never, ever, ever with sugar. So again, in order to make this palatable to the British market or to the European market, again, they added sugar. Um, needless to say, in order to run 
the, you know, in order to have these products actually available and to actually be able to grow it at a cheaper and cheaper price, uh, the whole slave trade then kind of began around these products and around these commodities. So uh, the upshot of this is taking products that were actually quite healthy, that were actually quite, um, you know, because of how they were fermented, they actually were more alkaline or neutral. Uh, and by adding sugars and pre preserving and serving up in the way that they did, they all of a sudden started to become extremely acid. Uh, not to mention the slavery, the exploitation, uh, globalization, uh, not to mention the health implications of, you know, of this kind of commodification. Um, and, you know, and it was, and at the same time as bringing things like tea, you know, the way that the Brits actually managed to get tea sold to the British people was through, was pretty much the, really the birth of marketing, where they started to show, um, you know, on television, how, you know, ordinary folk, as soon as they come home from a hard day's work, they just have a cup of tea and, ah, and everything is okay. And, and so it was kind of, you know, and, and you can still see this mentality really, really clearly that people still, oh, got a problem? No problem. Here's a cup of tea. Everything's going to be okay. But if you think about it, all these products are drugs. And tea and coffee and cigarettes are the only drug rituals that are actually legitimate. And the reason for legitimizing these drug rituals is because they knew in the Industrial Revolution, in order to keep people working and doing all these hard work, this monotonous, monotonous, not as hard work, is you need to stimulate them. You need to keep them going. You need to keep them awake, alert. So you need drugs to kind of keep them going. Hence, these drug rituals became a legitimate break. So, as I say, the upshot of all of this is with all these, you know, um, well, no, you tell me. With all these drugs, with all these, uh, this kind of acidification of diets, what's the implications to, to people's health? You know, and keeping them going, you know, it's hard work, hard work, hard work, but keeping them uh, artificially uh, to keep going. What do you think, imagine the upshot of that actually is for, for the general public's health? I think a lot of burnout. Mm -hmm. Burnout, what else? Um, I know from personal experience, having actually stopped drinking coffee um, last year, um, it is, um, it's stress enhancing. So that means when you had a coffee, you need another one and another one to calm down your stress levels. Um, <clears throat> it also has a lot of other side effects, like uh, particularly for women, I think migraines and, and headaches, which I don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, th there is a lot of side effects. Partly because it's a diuretic. So it's actually, you think when you're drinking something, you'll be adding water to your system. Uh -uh. But every time you drink coffee, you need about five times as much water to balance it out. And um, yeah, so ultimately it destroys people's immune systems. It... Um, as we know, with, uh, with, with the kind of the way that our, our uh, gut works, you know, we, we eat foods and whatever foods we eat, it takes energy to process it, to digest it. So first of all, you're, you know, you're consuming energy. You then, um, but then as a byproduct of that processing of, uh, you're left with, um, what's the term? It's, it's, the waste product that's left is either left in a form that is either acid, neutral or alkaline. And so this is why, you know, certain foods that may be known as um, acid, uh, acidic, 
when you eat them, they could be alkalizing. So that the waste product that's left at the end of it could actually be alkaline, as opposed to, you know, just because it is acidic when you take it, the byproduct of what's left over after the processing, you know, so yeah, that, that used to bug me. How come but that's right? But I eventually would figure that out. Um, thanks for Sunil, for those of you who know that beautiful soul. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so basically, um, the, yeah, depending on how acidic our system, how, how, yeah, how much waste is left over, will dictate, you know, so the more acidic the waste that's left over, the more toxic we are, the harder it therefore is for us to actually deal with other aspects of life, i.e. healing ourselves, i.e. mental, you know, um, clarity, et cetera, et cetera, which is why many of the kind of acid forming foods are really let, lead down this really kind of toxic path of mental, physical, um, yeah, real lows. So what are, um, and if you think about it, many of the foods that we're being sold as being, you know, things that we should all be eating are very much those kind of acidic foods. You know, it's all the sugars, the chocolates, the coffees. The, and have you ever questioned why we're being continuously sold these ideas of this is what we should be eating? Why aren't we told to eat, you know, just fresh veg and, you know, alkalizing foods? Why are we continuously bombarded with images and encouraged to eat these acid forming foods? When, when you're in a state of stress, like PTS, then you, you make worse decisions and that is sort of self-generating um, to more consumption of the same bad stuff and then it just continues great and i see what um steve has just put in the chat as well food is grown for profit not for human health absolutely so and it's not just that but who else benefits from people's ill health Pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical yeah, industry. Multi definitely. Billion dollar industry. And if everyone was healthy, this industry would not be needed. It would just almost disappear. It certainly wouldn't be making the billions that it's making. So the main reason why we are uh, in the state that we are today is because of the, the of, of uh, consumerism, and you know um, because of money and because it's profitable to make you unhealthy to make you fearful to make you um yeah not this most wonderful beautiful healthy vibrant human being um and it's all about money at the end of the day so um first of all let's what is everyone familiar with the difference between alkalizing and acidic forming foods is it worth going through some of those or is that most people familiar with that just to know you've got five minutes left okay okay cool all right so all right just very very quickly then the kind of acid forming foods and maybe the obvious ones you know the alcohols meats eggs um fish sugars you know artificial sugars um and so on and so forth and the the kind of alkalizing and and actually even grains. Um, the acid forming or oh, alkaline is more the kind of fresh fruits, vegetables, and so on and so forth. So, but you can balance out the grains with the, you know, with the amount of um, uh, fresh fruit and veg, you know. Unlike most people's diets, where you have maybe, I don't know, 60%, 70% of your meal is rice or some kind of grain and then 20 30 40 percent uh, 
the other way around. The other way around. It should be just 20%, 30% grains and 50, 60, 70% fresh fruits, vegetables, and so on and so forth to, to have a much more alkalizing kind of effect. So question is, uh, where do we get all these foods from? So in five minutes, uh, rather than me asking you, I guess I can, I guess maybe the, the answer is, is kind of obvious. We can grow our own. And if we can't grow our own, we grow in communities. If we can't grow in communities, let's start growing in, uh, you know, let's start setting up CSAs and things like that. So let's help support local farmers to help them to grow the kind of foods that we actually want in a way that we actually want it. So, um, yeah, so I guess where I'm going to is, is really, in order to really have a good, healthy diet, we really need to re rethink our diets massively. And we really need to rethink how and where we're getting it from. And obviously the, the knock-on effect from eating seasonal food, locally grown foods, is that this is actually much more better for our environment. So every single way we look at it, it's kind of a no-brainer. The sooner we learn how to grow our own foods um, and eat more seasonally, uh, you know, the better for, for everybody, for our health, for our surroundings, for the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but obviously one of the downsides of trying to grow all your own food is or growing as much of it as you can locally is that many foods only fruit at a particular time of year so they all give you you know you have all your apples you know within a few months so you know and certain um yes i don't know certain cabbages and what have you you know certain other things yeah they'll fruit at a particular time so what do you do for the rest of the year and this goes back to what we were saying right at the very beginning, is if we start to preserve these foods. And there's many, many, many ways to preserve them. We can dry it, we can freeze it, we can, um, uh, yeah, you know, th there's so many different techniques, you know, preserve it in oils and vinegars and all sorts of things. But actually, without any question, the one form of food preservation that adds so much more life is lacto-fermentation because of how it, um, as I say, when you know, th this process of, um, of encouraging the lactobacillus to actually break down and convert all the, the lactic acid or to convert all the carbohydrates into lactic acid um, actually creates an environment that really is populated, massively populated with really beneficial bacteria for your gut. But it also, as I say, it changes the molecular structure of your foods to make it so much more um, you know, available, you know, make the nutrients so much more available. You know, it's kind of pre-digesting. If you think about it, our stomach is pretty much one big fermentation tank. And what we're doing by fermenting it before is we're making it much easier to digest and make use of. So, yeah, so every way we look at it comes back down to if we really want to have a nutritionally uh, beneficial uh, diet, as well as a diet that is friendly towards um, the environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's all about growing locally. It's all about, you know, getting back into seasonal foods, low maintenance foods, nutritionally dense foods, and thinking about how we can make those last by fermenting them. I think that's it. That's my talk. And I think time's up. Is that correct? Or? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. So, sorry, I know I didn't really prepare that and I just kind of started speaking. Are there any questions? Can we have room for a few questions one yeah of course yeah it looks like Wendelin may have some have one say. I'm really curious to know Rakesh if you have like a, a recipe book or something where you've got all your 
great things you've been doing with food in collect <laughs> oh yeah be good to share a, i just made a, a class ah oh, oh my god i made the most beautiful so i grow kind of beetroots uh but i leave them for almost two years so that i just continuously get greens and i get uh seed pods and flowers and all kinds of stuff from it so by the time i finished this beetroot is like it's like stone you know you, you can't really eat it so i make this kwas this uh, fermented drink from it oh my word it's so just really fills you with life and um and then it actually also breaks down the, the beetroot so you can even kind of eat it as well at the end um so i just started making some more of that um what are you putting with your beetroot in the crust because there are different ways are you using just like a brine or are you using brine. old bread mm -hmm. just brine. i don't use whey um obviously whey is the um traditional way but because i don't have dairy and stuff um yeah, so I use salt to kickstart it. That's delicious. If you go to places like Turkey, uh, you'll see people drinking this. Uh, yeah, drinking this, you know, on pretty much on every roadside. It's fantastic. It's great stuff. And yeah, and I just collected yesterday uh, some Pruna spinosa, which I'm fermenting as well. That's, um, yeah, fantastic. For, yeah, I mean, it's it's so abundant no one knows what to do with it even the birds don't even bother with it most of the time so there's so much of it that in england because it's native um it's planted everywhere it's one of these plants that trees that the woodland trust is just giving away for free to people to plant everywhere so everywhere you go it's um it's just everywhere it's just absolutely everywhere so it's, it's a really simple you know free and you know and once you ferment it um you're then left with a liquid that is pretty much a crust anyway yeah so you can just kind of water it down a little bit and then bang you've got a nice fermented drink if you really wanted you could do a secondary ferment and add some sugar to it or something and make it a little bit more fizzy and turn it into like a carbonated drink but um yeah i mean to be honest i i just play around i don't really have recipes i just just yeah have my patterns and i just mess around with them and yeah i think that's a really nice way to look at it like we've been speaking about that rickish haven't we kind of like pattern pattern understanding way of working because both me and rickish often talk that we don't really use recipes um and i think there was a nice um mind map that um who had that there was a nice one i saw about yeah. fermentation um so just yeah like looking at the, like, the different patterns like what kind of you know product is it is it leafy is it hard is it squishy whatever and then thinking about the different ways you could preserve it mm -hmm. um and i think that's a really nice way to think about like yeah preserving and preparing foods like thinking about different patterns because there are so many things where it's not really you don't need like for each individual kind of plant like a different recipe you can just do it in quite like a nice general way depending on the qualities of what you have to begin with the way that i teach it so i was teaching a, a fermentation course i've done a couple in the last few weeks and the way i explained it to them is to think about what is it you want to end up with so what what is the process you know so that the process of in, you know the first 24 hours is you kill all of the bad bacteria by creating a, this lacto, you know, or by utilizing salt and creating a saline a condition, you kill off all the bad bacteria and you predominate it with lactobacillus. And then in the next three, four days, you're essentially just turning the lactic acids into, uh, or the sugars into lactic acids. And then after that, it's just aging. So what does it take to kind of get you into that process you know so if you think about each vegetable each leaf each whatever it is you're trying to ferment uh you then just need to think about yeah uh how quickly so for example someone had two pumpkins one of which was really really hard and the other one which is really really soft so if you want 
the, the bacteria to start breaking it down. If you want to do it fairly fast, the, the really soft one, you can just put into chunks and bang, it will go. Whereas the harder one, grate it, make it much softer, make it much smaller so that it has much better ability to, to break down. So it's just understanding these patterns of trying to understand where you're trying to get to. What does nature do? How does the, how does the bacteria work on each of these? Uh, you know, and then obviously the temperature, you know, between 15 and 25 degrees centigrade, you know, when it's colder, it's going to be much slower and therefore it, it might not happen. You know, you may not get the whole full process if it's below that. If it's above that, it will ferment really, really quickly and therefore you need to keep an eye on it. And so it's just understanding these little patterns and then you can just play, just play. I mean, there's almost nothing that can actually go wrong. The only thing that can go wrong is if you end up with um, either a, a black or a red uh, mold. If you get either of those, yeah, bin it. Anything else, it's still okay. You know, even if you get cam yeast, it's still okay. You can still eat it. It's not a problem. So yeah, so you can really have fun with lactose fermentation. And even if you don't use salt, you know, you can still understand how you know, it starts to decay, but you realize and recognize that, yeah, I can't, this isn't a long-term preserve because I haven't guaranteed to have killed all the bad bacteria. So it could, you know, but it will still lacto-ferment. It will still start to ferment, but it won't be a long-term preserve because you cannot guarantee that it, uh, that, you know, what bacteria are, are actually in there. So, so those kind of things you just eat you know four or five days later you've finished it but you've still got a ferment going anyway patterns <laughs> lovely okay so we've kind of spoken through the break um but i think that's okay because we maybe don't need so many breaks um so yeah thanks for that rakesh i'm gonna stop this recording and then start again for the next session